Preparing for Negotiation from the Art of Negotiating by Gerard Nierenberg, read by Vincent Bagnall. Thinking is more interesting than knowing, but less interesting than looking. Goethe. If you know that within one month you will find yourself across the table from your negotiating opponents, how do you prepare for this face to face encounter? How can you foresee the strategy of the opposite side? And how can you prepare to cope with it? The answer is not a simple one. It may be summed up, however, in a phrase reminiscent of school days. Do your homework. There are any number of life situations for which preparation is necessary. Negotiation is one of these. For successful results, it requires the most intensive type of long and short-range preparation. Know thyself. This preparation requires, first of all, intimate knowledge of yourself. If you can be easily goaded to anger, you are very apt to be tricked into an unfavorable settlement because of your emotional state. People in an emotional state do not want to think, and they are particularly susceptible to the power of suggestion from a clever opponent. The angry person cannot instantly change direction, even if he finds that he has just made a ridiculous blunder. The excitable person is putty in the hands of a calm, even-tempered negotiator, a negotiator who has learned how to use emotions only for effect. For these reasons, a long-range preparation for negotiation must begin with a form of self-evaluation. It involves an intimate examination of your sense of values your philosophy of life. It means, in a sense, taking stock of your intellectual and emotional makeup. The question may well be raised whether an individual can accomplish this soul-searching by himself. Sometimes this can be done only with professional help. The procedure resembles the techniques of psychoanalysis. The goal, however, is not the cure of a neurosis, but the ironing out of any obvious personality defect the ferreting out of hidden bias and fixed prejudice, and the examination in general of those traits and quirks of the mind that interfere with your negotiating ability. The basic precept is know thyself, as Polonius advises his son, to thine own self be true. How do you go about examining yourself? You must have the courage to ask yourself many disturbing questions, perhaps beginning, what in general do you seek in life? What do you want out of your business career? What do you want from this particular situation? Going from the general to the specific is by no means an easy task. As Lincoln Barnett has stated, you will be trying to transcend yourself and perceive yourself in the act of perception. Somebody is likened the self-reflective process to the endlessly repeated image that we see of ourselves. When seated in the barber's chair between two mirrors, hundreds of images of our face sweep out in a curve that stretches back to infinity. Perhaps each face in the long row is some particular aspect of our character that demands an examination. If we can ask each reflected face the correct question, then they will all fuse together into one complete, healthy personality. The problem of self-evaluation becomes still more involved if we imagine seeing our image reflected from two distorting mirrors. The distortion resulting, let us say, from our personality complexes. Other long-range training for negotiation calls for the exercise of a variety of skills. You must have the patience and accuracy of a scientist in searching the literature of past experiments. You must combine the scientific attitude with the cunning of a detective in digging up facts and figures about your opposition. You should be able to apply the current teachings of psychology to predict what the other fellow will try to do. To solve a problem, it sometimes becomes necessary and important to learn many new long-range skills, an important one being the art of listening. My father learned the art of listening at a rather early age, when he was 14, and thought he knew everything. An old relative took him aside and said, George, if you want to have the same knowledge at 21 that you have now at 14, then continue to talk rather than listen. 
because if you continue to talk, you won't know any more at 21 than you know now. La Rochefoucauld states this another way. One of the reasons that we find so few persons rational and agreeable in conversation is that there is hardly a person who does not think more of what he wants to say than of his answer to what is said. The skill of listening, concentrating on what was being said, as well as what is not being said, can prove to be enormously helpful in negotiations. After you have completed your research, you must keep an open mind and always be ready to make changes in your appraisal of the situation. It is possible that some of the facts may require modification or that your approach must be changed. Lapse of time alone often tends to call for a change in strategy. Therefore, it's important to be constantly on the alert for new developments. It has been said that one never loses until one gives up. In 1935, the Nuremberg Decrees went into effect. By 1936, all borders of Germany were sealed to the Jews. Yet sitting next to me at a closing in 1955 was a real estate investor who had managed the almost impossible feat, not only of escaping with his life, but also of taking his life savings out of Germany. The passage of time did not dim his satisfaction and pride in telling the story of this feat. The essential elements were ingenuity and guts. It was necessary for him to trade all of his holdings at a huge discount for United States registered corporate bonds. Ingenuity enabled him to contact an agent in Switzerland, who he hoped would register the bonds in the U.S. in the name of the new Jewish purchaser. He had committed his fortune to the oral promises of others. All of this accomplished, he had to take the next step. After memorizing the precious serial numbers with guts, he lit a match and made a small bonfire. Paying the necessary bribery fee, he was permitted to cross the German border penniless. When he arrived in the United States, he went straight to the office of the register agent for the corporation that had issued the bonds. He reported the destruction of the bonds and their serial numbers and received replacements shortly afterwards. Do your homework. An important phase of short-range preparation for negotiation is research. Research should be objective. Objective not in the quality of the evidence you gather, but in your attitude towards such evidence. There's a positive reason for amassing information. It amasses a wealth of material in your mind so that you may take advantage of any new development in the negotiation. You should be prepared with every possible kind of information about the people with whom you're going to negotiate. When President Kennedy was preparing to go to Vienna for his first meeting with Khrushchev, he made it a point to study all of Khrushchev's speeches and public statements. He also studied all the other material available relating to the premier, even including his preference in breakfast food and his tastes in music. It's doubtful if such intensive research would be required in most negotiating situations, but the extreme importance of President Kennedy's conference warranted this meticulous search for every detail concerning his protagonist. An increasing need for facts in all areas today is causing a growing furor about such ideas as a national data center, a giant computerized dossier bank that could pull together all the scattered statistics about any American and make them available to those who needed them. It is a distasteful idea to many, and yet the negotiator must sometimes subordinate his personal feelings about snooping to the demands of the negotiation process. To utilize the information you obtain from research, you must rely upon your general fund of knowledge and experience. It is essential to examine the opponent's past history, Inquire into previous transactions he was connected with and look into every business venture or deal he has consummated. Also, investigate any deals he has failed to conclude successfully. Frequently, you will learn as much or more about people from their failures as from their successes. If you carefully analyze the reasons that a certain deal fell through or a negotiation failed, you will probably get a good understanding of how the opponent thinks, his method of operating, his psychological approach, all this will give you clues to his needs and prepare you to negotiate with him more advantageously.
Consider what proposals he made, what counter-proposals he rejected, and why. How flexible he was in the bargaining, how emotional was his approach. You can obtain clues about the positions that business firms will take by studying some of their past transactions. Sources like the following can prove helpful. Budgets and financial plans, publications and reports, press releases, instructional and educational material, institutional advertising, reports of government agencies like the Securities and Exchange Commission, officer speeches and public statements, company biographies in Moody's and Standard & Poor's, Suppose you are studying an opponent's previous deal that involves the purchase or sale of real estate. The value of the tax stamps that were affixed to the recorded deed will tell the price at which the property was sold. Bear in mind, however, that there have been instances where an excess amount in tax stamps has purposely been used to attempt to hide the actual price of the property. Do not rely on one source. There are other agencies that will assist you in getting a fairly close idea of how much the property was sold for. Try to use more than one source for verification. Merely by investigating a previous real estate sale, you can get an idea of what kind of man you're going to deal with. You can find out how long he had held the property before he decided to sell it, and how much profit he was satisfied to take. All these factors are useful in sizing up a prospective opponent. You can never know too much about the person with whom you will negotiate. In the words of Francis Bacon, in his essay of negotiating, if you would work any man, you must either know his nature and fashions, and so lead him or his ends, and so persuade him or his weakness and disadvantages, and so awe him or those that have interest in him, and so govern him. In dealing with cunning persons, we must ever consider their ends, to interpret their speeches, and it is good to say little to them, and that which they least look for. In all negotiations of difficulty, a man may not look to sow and reap at once, but must prepare business, and so ripen it by degrees. A trial lawyer's cross-examination of his adversary's expert witness should be more than a spur-of-the-moment inspiration. It must be prepared effectively. In New York State negligence cases, lawyers are required to submit the plaintiff to an examination by the defendant's doctor. No experienced attorney would let the client attend such an examination without him. When the attorney is in the doctor's office, he may have a chance to look at the doctor's library. It is advisable for him to take note of books that may have subject matter dealing with his client's injury. At the trial, a most effective cross-examination worked out in advance can be conducted by having the doctor admit that certain books are the outstanding authority in the field, and that further having the doctor admit that he possesses a copy of the book in his own library. As a result of having carefully analyzed these medical books, the prepared trial attorney will have devised a cross-examination to test any doctor's mettle as to whether he is really a qualified expert. In examining a person's library, you can gain useful information which will add to your store of facts about him, his present and past interests, his hobbies, intellectual pursuits, even the extent to which he is able to follow a subject through. Another quite effective method of short-range preparation is to check records of previous litigation involving the prospective opponent. And these are available through litigation reports, which may be bought. In addition to finding out if there are any recorded judgment against him, it will prove useful to know all details about any lawsuits in which he was involved. A fruitful source of information is inquiries made of the people who have litigated with your opponent. An amazing amount of useful information can be obtained from these people. They invariably contribute some facts and opinions that are not found in the ordinary record. And these same methods of approach can be employed not only to investigate the party with whom you are going to negotiate, but also to learn more about somebody you may want to enlist on your side in the negotiation. Almost 90% of the information that seems most difficult to obtain can be gotten by a direct approach. Try sitting down with your telephone and asking questions. Negotiating techniques. The following are examples of an overall strategy called lowballing. This strategy combines apparent withdrawal and reversal. It is applied on three levels, interpersonal, interorganizational or corporate, and international. Selling automobiles is a highly competitive business. Many potential buyers try to take advantage of this by going from dealer to dealer with the request, just give me the price. Sooner or later, the buyer will be hit with a lowball price, one that is too low to be realistic and may even be below the dealer's cost. 
After the buyer has completed his appointed rounds, he will return to the low ball dealer. He will expect that since he has completed his negotiation, there's nothing more to talk about. But the negotiations have just begun. The salesman will assail him with extras and high-priced financing. He may take the order and never deliver or switch to another car. The lowball price will be blown to bits. On the corporate level, the roles can be reversed. This time, the seller is the victim, but the strategy is essentially the same. It is used when a business is in dire straits and must be sold immediately. The potential buyer offers a price or a deal that he knows is unrealistically good. He stalls, but continues to offer the lure until all other potential buyers have lost interest. Then he offers his real price on a take-it-or-leave-it basis that the seller must accept. Dumping of surplus goods is an honest form of lowballing. The selling price is low, so low that it drives the competing industries in another nation out of business. Then the rival nation enjoys a monopoly position and charges monopoly prices. The when strategy. When strategy can be separated into several of the following. Forbearance, surprise, fait accompli, bland withdrawal, apparent withdrawal, reversal, limits, and fainting. Here are a few examples. Forbearance, or waiting in haste. Age is a great teacher of this strategy. It is seldom used by the young or the insecure. Circumstances that warrant this strategy usually have elements that would ordinarily tempt or provoke one to anger and impetuous action. However, forbearance, or the withholding of such action, will be used when it offers a greater reward. The reverse of forbearance is the rash act. Your judgment and values determine whether forbearance or acting immediately would be warranted. The Quakers furnish an example. When members of a Quaker meeting find themselves divided on a question, it is customary to declare a period of silence. If the division still persists, the clerk postpones the question for another time or a later meeting. This can go on indefinitely until the question is resolved. Forbearance thus avoids a direct conflict and eventually achieves a settlement. Franklin D. Roosevelt used to tell a story about the Chinese use of forbearance based on 4,000 years of civilization. Two coolies were arguing heatedly in the midst of a crowd. A stranger expressed surprise that no blows were being struck. His Chinese friend explained, the man who strikes first admits that his ideas have given out. Knowing when to stop is another element of forbearance. The salesman must know when to stop talking. The attorney must know when he has sufficiently cross-examined the witness. Earlier in this book, we related the story of the last tenant in the old office building. This negotiation was probably carried out past the point where it would have been wise to stop. Benjamin Disraeli recognized this factor when he said, Next to knowing when to seize an advantage, the most important thing in life is to know when to forego an advantage. Surprise. This strategy involves a sudden shift in method, argument, or approach. The change usually is drastic and dramatic, although it need not always be so. Sometimes, in fact, the change can be ushered in by as insignificant a sign as the alteration of the tone of voice during a negotiation. Where you have carried on the entire negotiation in a calm, even voice, one blow-up can effectively make the point. Winston Churchill illustrates this when he states, I have often tried to set down the strategic truths I have comprehended in the form of simple anecdotes, and they rank this way in my mind. One of them is the celebrated tale of the man who gave powder to the bear. He mixed the powder with the greatest care, making sure that not only the ingredients but the proportions were absolutely correct. He rolled it up in a large paper spill and was about to blow it down the bear's throat. But the bear blew first. Next strategy, fate accompli, or now what can you do? This is a risky strategy, but it is often a temptation. It demands that you act, achieve your goal against the opposition, and then see what the other side will do about it. Those who employ this strategy must make an appraisal of the consequences in case it should prove to be a failure. An illustration of the unsuccessful application of this strategy was the attack by England, France, and Israel upon Egypt during the Suez Crisis. They acted without prior consultation with the U.S. and hoped to present the world with a fait accompli. 
The U.S. intervened, however, and forced them to abandon the attack and to withdraw. Strategy Bland Withdrawal Who, me? An example of this strategy is the person who is caught red-handed, but who turns and says, Who, me? The following illustration, while not directly related to negotiation, is in essence similar to maneuvers that are frequently encountered at the bargaining table. During the 64 presidential campaign, the press would attack Senator Goldwater for some statement he was alleged to have made, but Goldwater would say that he had been misquoted, or that he never had said anything of the kind, or that what he was accused of saying had been taken out of context, which altered the meaning altogether. However, the very frequency of his use of this strategy made it ineffective to all but his most ardent admirers. The newspapers just couldn't be wrong all the time, or so a majority of the voters thought. Next strategy, apparent withdrawal the man who wasn't there. This strategy is made up of a mixture of forbearance, self-discipline, and a little deception. The aim is to convince your opponent that you have withdrawn, but without his knowing it, you are still in control of the situation. I use this strategy with a certain degree of success in litigation involving the Rent Commission of the City of New York. The Rent Commission has determined that a hearing be scheduled at a time that was arbitrary and would prove detrimental to my client. The New York Supreme Court agreed that the scheduling of the proposed hearing would be detrimental. However, instead of granting an injunction which had been requested, the court merely suggested to the Rent Commission that it should postpone the hearing. In spite of the request of the court, the Rent Commission went ahead with the hearing. I attended this hearing, but before it began, I had the official stenographer take down a statement for the record. I warn everyone in attendance that this hearing is being held against the wishes of the Supreme Court. I will see to it that the court is so informed and I will follow this matter through to its normal consequences. Moreover, I will not be a party to this hearing at this time. Having made this statement, I stalked out of the room. My withdrawal apparently was complete. However, unknown to the hearing officer of the Rent Commission, an associate of mine remained in the hearing room. Seated with a group of witnesses that had been called, he was prepared to take over in the event that the Rent Commission chose to go ahead with the hearing. And the strategy, fortunately, was effective. The person in charge of the hearing was unsure of how to proceed. He called the Rent Commissioner for advice and was told to adjourn the hearing. How, thereafter, the Commissioner was persuaded that landlords are members of the community and important ones and that no one can be victimized without harm to everybody. Strategy Reversal In this strategy, you act in opposition to what may be considered to be the popular trend or goal. Bernard Baruch once said that people who make money in the stock market are those who are the first in and the first out. By this he meant that you should buy when everyone was pessimistic and sell when the prevailing atmosphere was optimistic. This strategy may sound easy to execute, but in reality it is exceedingly difficult. Were it not so, we could all immediately become rich and powerful. Gertrude Stein reversed a popular concept about Wall Street when she said that the money remains the same. It is merely the pockets that change. New methods of communication have caused a reverse in many traditional negotiating roles. I once had occasion to, to accompany a coffee purchaser on a buying trip into the Amazon jungle. I asked if he had any special method of negotiating for the coffee, and he laughed and said, I no longer negotiate. I am told how much I have to pay. He explained the most remote tribes in the Amazon that gather coffee have shortwave radios. They get the latest prices from the New York Coffee Exchange. They then add the cost of transportation, allow a small handling charge, and tell the buyer which price he must pay. Limits strategy. This is the absolute end. The French have become famous for using the time limit as a strategic method. Restricted agenda is also a form of limit, that is, you will not negotiate on more than one subject, or you will negotiate only in one particular manner. Restrictions on communication are also a use of this strategy. You will deal only through your agent, or you restrict the communication coming out of a negotiation. When this approach is carried to an extreme, we have what is known as the silent barter. Some tribes in Central Africa engage in a unique form of negotiation. The tribe desiring an exchange 
leaves its goods on the bank of a river. A neighboring tribe takes these goods, leaving other goods which they consider of equal value. If the first tribe is not satisfied, they leave the pile there until it is added to. In the event that no additions are made, the first tribe doesn't show up to do business again. Strategy fainting. Look to the right, go to the left. This involves an apparent move in one direction to divert attention from the real goal or object. It can also involve a situation in which you give your opponent a false impression that you have more information or knowledge than you really possess. This strategy has been successfully used in criminal trials. The district attorney is duty-bound to tell the court all the information and facts that he has in his possession. He may not withhold from the court any evidence that may be pertinent to the case, even though it may not help the prosecution. He does not always do this. Fainting strategy by defense counsel may lead the district attorney to believe that counsel is in possession of all the information, and therefore the district attorney may feel the obligation now to tell the court all rather than continue to withhold pertinent facts. The how and where strategy. Some of the principal forms of how and where strategy are participation, association, disassociation, crossroads, blanket, randomizing, random sample, salami, bracketing. Next strategy, participation. We are friends. In this form of strategy, you strive to enlist the aid of other parties in your behalf, to act either directly or indirectly. International alliances like NATO or the Warsaw Pact are good examples of this form. Each participant will probably assist the other with his individually different strategy. This includes Me Too strategy, such as has been used in the maritime labor relations field. As reported in the New York Times, August 28, 1965, almost every maritime union has a clause in its contract that if something better than what the contract terms delineate is later granted to another union, it will be automatically added to the first contract. The Times stated that this is one of the chief reasons why the merchant marine strike went through its 73rd day without a settlement. It would appear that this strategy of the union backfired. The association strategy. This technique is used extensively in the advertising field. Testimonials assert that a famous person uses and endorses a certain cigarette, soap, hairdressing, or some other product. These testimonials associate the product with the rich, important, powerful personages who endorse it. Many people identify themselves with these personalities and begin to use the product. Many businessmen who feel that they would be too sophisticated to be influenced by this advertising tactic fail to realize it is related to the business device of electing famous military or political figures to the board of directors of corporations. The corporation is now supposed to benefit from the halo effect of these famous people. Next strategy, disassociation. Who is your friend? Obviously, this strategy is the reverse of association. A product, or more frequently a cause, is discredited by showing that unsavory characters are connected with it. This is a form of strategy that is often used in politics by both the extreme left and the extreme right. It calls the attention of the general public to the kind of people who are associated with a particular movement, cause, or proposal. It is hoped that the assumed reputation of the people connected with the movement will steer the public in the opposite direction, away from the association. Strategy crossroads, or intersect, entwine, and entangle. In this form of strategy, you may introduce several matters into the discussion so that you can make concessions on one and gain on the other. Minor issues, however, should be handled carefully. If you take too much time with them, the other side will start fighting back as if they were large issues. Then, as the opponent gives in, he does it expecting a concession on a major issue. 
It also covers the situation where you bring forces, arguments, or pressures of some kind to bear on a particular object of the negotiation. And this corresponds to a military tactic in which machine guns are placed so as to create a devastating crossfire and cover an area more thoroughly. In chess, this approach is used where pressure from many pieces is applied to one of the opponent's pieces or spaces. Strategy blanket or shotgun. The aim of this strategy is to cover as large a field as possible. It is well illustrated by the story of a young man who, whenever he went to the movies, picked out a seat next to a young lady. He would then suggest that she kiss him. His friend, on hearing this, said to him, I imagine that you get your face slapped quite a few times. The young man replied, Yes, I do, but I also get an awful lot of good kissing. There is a certain group of businessmen who are called deal men. They are, in a sense, business brokers trying to bring together the buyer and seller or other elements required. Different techniques are used by the more sagacious. However, the ordinary deal man uses the shotgun method. Without regard to the consequences, he brings together as many people as possible, hoping that two of them may match up and permit him to make a commission. I myself prefer the rifle method. Randomizing technique, or outbluffing by chance. In this strategy, you make use of the law of chance to defeat the bluffing advantage in a game. For example, I had become quite proficient in the game of guessing which hand the coin is in. By sleight of hand, I fooled my son over and over again. He continually made a very high percentage of wrong guesses. Then, he decided to base his guesses on the law of chance. He tossed his own coin to decide his choice. When he did this, he guessed right at least 50% of the times over a long period of guesses and tosses. Randomizing, using the law of chance, improved his score by making my bluffing useless. Building calls for a system of betting in which off-track bookers pay at track odds. Track odds are, of course, based on the total amount wagered at the track on each horse. When the off-track bookies pay at track odds, they are able to keep for themselves the percentage taken off by the track for expenses and taxes. Strategy Random Sample Fibbers Configure this involves picking a sample and assuming that the sample that has been chosen will represent the whole. Political parties use this frequently to show the general public that a survey they have taken indicates that their candidate will be the winner. The deception consists in planting the people who take the survey in carefully selected areas. Statistics presented in negotiation are often based on random samples and must be closely scrutinized. How to detect biased samples deceptive averages, and other irregularities is set forth in How to Lie with Statistics by Daryl Huff and Irving Getz. There's a story of the traveler who was reluctant to fly in an airplane because he heard about people carrying bombs on planes. Discussing his fear with a friend, a statistician, he asked him, what is the probability of a bomb being on the same plane that I might take? The statistician figured it out and came up with something like one in ten million. The traveler thought a while and then said, what is the probability of two bombs being on the same plane? The statistician worked it out and replied, I wouldn't be concerned. The probability is so remote, it could never happen in your lifetime. A year later, the traveler met the statistician, and the statistician asked him how things were going. He said, oh, I've been flying all over. Now I'm no longer concerned about someone bringing a bomb aboard the plane that I'm on. I always carry a bomb with me. Difficult as it may be to believe, a story has it that the Beatles owe part of the early success to the strategy of random sample. The late Brian Epstein, their manager, recognized the group's potential long before the general public knew of their existence. The Beatles' initial popularity was limited to the Liverpool area. Their records did not show up on the overall hit charts. Epstein decided to change all this. He sent his agents into the various towns in England where the record charts were compiled. Within a concentrated period of time, they bought up Beatle records which Epstein then resold in his own record shops. The Beatles' popularity rating zoomed, and they were off to the races. One result of this strategy is that Britain has been helped to balance its books for a year or two. In the fall of 67, when President Johnson's popularity was at a low ebb, certain backers arranged for polls to be taken. The polls were restricted to areas where Johnson was likely to be very strong. Furthermore, they pitted him against not too strong opponents. 
The results were then publicized as an upturn in the president's popularity. The research firms involved were chagrined, but the backers of the polls had accomplished what they had set out to do. Strategy salami, or degree-wise. This strategy involves taking something bit by bit so that you eventually get possession of the entire piece. Matthias Rakosi, General Secretary of the Hungarian Communist Party, is credited with having given this technique its name. Rakosi explained the salami operation to his collaborators as follows. When you want to get hold of a salami which your opponents are strenuously defending, you must not grab at it. You must start carving for yourself a very thin slice. The owner of the salami will hardly notice it, or at least he will not mind very much. The next day, you will carve another slice, then still another, and so little by little the whole salami will pass into your possession. This nibbling process has been very much in evidence in the actions of the communists since World War II. In line with this approach, never make it appear that you are trying to take anything away from your adversary, no matter how slight. A good salesman in the nut store does not overload the tray with nuts and then remove a portion of them in order to get the proper weight. He gradually builds the order up to the proper weight, adding, never subtracting. Strategy bracketing. How to make and hit the mark. This expression is taken from the old artillery term in which the first shell was arranged to fire above the target, the second below the target, and therefore this bracket was split successfully until reduced to an on-target distance. An executive of a large business firm explained his ability to retain his top position by saying he used the strategy of bracketing. His duties require him to make many decisions. He does not spend all of the decision time trying to be right on target. He is satisfied if he is in the right area. Thereafter, he merely cuts down the degree of error. In conclusion, our study of the art of negotiation has included an examination of the philosophy and psychology of negotiating and the preparation that is necessary. We have considered human behavior both in its relation to negotiation and its connection with fundamental human needs. Negotiation is a tool of human behavior. It's a tool that anyone can use effectively. I've tried to avoid shaping it into a specialized tool that would be suitable for use only by professionals. I've sought to give the realm of negotiation new forms that are allied to the forms of other types of human activities. The successful negotiator must combine the alertness and speed of an expert swordsman with an artist's sensitivity. He must watch his adversary across the bargaining table with the keen eye of a fencer, ever ready to spot any loophole in the defense, any shift in strategy. He is prepared to thrust at the slightest opportunity. On the other hand, he must also be the sensitive artist, perceptive of the slightest variation in the color of his opponent's mood or motivation. At the correct moment, he must be able to select from his palette of many colors exactly the right combination of shades and tints that will lead to mastery. Success in negotiation, aside from adequate training, is essentially a matter of sensitivity and correct timing. Finally, the mature negotiator will have an understanding of the cooperative pattern. He will try to achieve agreement and will remember that in a successful negotiation, everyone wins. And if this is the case, why shoot it out? when we can still talk it out.